Hello and welcome to the Investing on the Go podcast brought to you by Fund Calibre. I'm Ryan Lightfoot-Brown and today I'm joined by David Harrison, manager of the Rathbone Global Sustainability Fund, which is on Fund Calibre's Elite Radar. David, thank you very much for your time. No, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Um, one of the big stories over the last six months or so is the US election. Um, we've now seen the Senate flip to a, a tied one um, with the Democrats with the casting vote and a Biden administration um, come in. So they've got quite strong views on environmental policy. What opportunities exist for the funds with that in mind? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Ryan. So we think actually this is really significant, um, you know, kind of framing it, I guess, we think you've seen already with what Biden said about the, the commitment to rejoin the Paris Accord. Um, you know, we see the U.S. playing a much more leadership role in, in climate space, which we think is is very, very important to, for us all, really, to, to have the U.S. playing more of a leadership role. Um, we think that we're likely to see um, a lot of stimulus targeting um, environmental um, kind of policy, green infrastructure. Um, and we think there's there's a lot of follow on from that in the US um, and, and kind of globally. The way that we think about it, we kind of break out into two areas, really. If you think about um, areas such as renewables, um, the US only has about 20% penetration rate of renewables. Um, so we see lots of opportunities um, in areas such as wind. Um, we've owned a number of wind companies such as Vestas listed in, in Denmark, which has lots of exposure um, in, in the US anyway. But also um, we've been adding more wind exposure um, through Orsted, which is one of the leading operators. We've also got a business called um, Hannon Armstrong um, Sustainable Finance. And we think this is kind of really fascinating fascinating because um, Hannon Armstrong is exposed to not only wind and solar, but also they're one of the leading players um, in kind of energy efficiency of buildings. Um, you know, a stat I heard the other day was that they think they could cut 40% of emissions in the US by making buildings more energy efficient. So we think someone like Hannon Armstrong is very um, you know, well exposed to that area. So I think that one side of, of renewables is a really powerful area. And we think it's a multi-year driver with lots of opportunities. I think the other, other, other part that's really interesting to us um, is when you think about the transport transport fleet. So um, people speak about electrification, moving away from uh, carbon kind of heavy engines, you know, well below 5% penetration in the US. Again, we're likely to see lots of legislation to um, accelerate this. Um, and it's interesting that a lot of the kind of big automakers, you've seen Ford and GM, really accelerate their commitment to electrification. So you know, we've had a business called Aptiv in the fund um, uh, since we launched. Aptiv is kind of that nerve center of an electric vehicle. Um, you know, we think it's still really well placed and you know for the long run. Um, and it's got a management team that was very forward thinking what it's doing. Um, but we're kind of thinking, you know, other areas that you, know, you think about the US um, in terms of its just geographic size, there's going to be different technologies as well as electric. So we've been looking more and more at hydrogen. Um, we spent a long time looking at um, kind of hydrogen fuel cells. And we've actually um, bought into a business called um, Ballard Power Systems, which is Canadian listed. Um, but really, if you think about, um, you know, kind of those big trucks, you know, things that have to go a long distance that can have a heavier um, kind of power source. We think hydrogen fuel cells is really interesting. So, yeah, it's it's such a fascinating area. Um, we think the legislation, we think we're at that kind of inflection point of adoption. Um, but the one thing I, I, like I always say, I think, to you is that we, we stick to our knitting in terms of the companies that we're looking at. Um, clearly, there's lots more coming to market but it's to focus on buying those businesses that are truly sustainable and are fundamentally sound. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, and outside of the US, I've seen you've been increasing your weight to Asia in the portfolio. Why is that? Yeah, so I think Asia has always been a really interesting area um, in terms of the particularly technology providers and companies that are um, helping drive sustainability forward. I think historically, even two and a half, three years ago, sometimes the transparency of um, kind of sustainability metrics in Asia was not as good. 
we've seen um, a step change in that. Um, but also we're just seeing more um, interesting opportunities for us. So recently we bought a Japanese business called Nidec. Now Nidec is the, is the global leader in, in small motors. Um, you know, it's all they do, they do it very, very well. And again, thinking about electric vehicles, um, the, the small motors required in an electric vehicle um, compared to a traditional vehicle, um, it, it, the requirement's a lot higher. NIDEC has a leading position there. Again, a management team that is very much committed to sustainability and has great transparency. So that's one we've added. Um, in terms of our pipeline, I'd say it's getting stronger and stronger in Asia. Um, and it's an area that we're very excited about for the, for the next several years. And uh, I know you sort of, you use the UNSTGs in your um, in your process. Are there any areas in particular this year that you're looking at or think are very pertinent to the investment case? Yeah, I, I think you know we obviously all the the STGs are really important. But if I had to highlight, uh, I would probably highlight three actually for you. So um, obviously clean energy, which I think is number seven, um, but also two others, uh, number nine, which is innovation and infrastructure, and also number 11, sustainable cities. So if you if you kind of put all those three together, I'd say about 50% of the fund is exposed to those um, STGs in one way or another. Um, you know, clearly what we've come through um, in the last 12 months, and we're still going through it at the moment, is going to lead to a lot of structural changes. Um, but really, the opportunity to come out of this in a better position. You know, we've spoken quickly about um, green infrastructure spending, but we think it, it means wholesale changes um, in terms of how we work and how we live, how we consume, how different industries work. And we see multiple opportunities um, in terms of the innovation theme, as well as the clean energy. Um, and perhaps the sustainable cities theme is something um, that is longer term. But again, in terms of ideas, we're seeing a, a very strong pipeline at the moment. And can you perhaps talk about what a sustainable city is and what that means for the fund and for your investors? Yeah, so that's a very good question. I think when you think about sustainable cities, it, it's something, it, it's a lot of things at once. So if you kind of, you know, I suppose at most basic, it's thinking about the buildings, um, the new buildings that we're making in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of mobility in that building. How do you cut down on emissions? How do you make things from, from a social point of view and a well-being point of view better to work and live in? But then if you think about connectivity, how do you move around that city? So in terms of the transport fleet, um, you know, it, it, you know, is it more... It, linked in terms of cycling, walking, um, less requirement on, on vehicles. Data is another area within smart cities. Um, you know, we talk about 5G. 5G will be a real um, kind of accelerator of the ability to, to link everything together. So when you think about the concept of you know, the internet of things, um, that is going to be a key part um, of, of a smart city. So th there's lots, and sometimes it can be overwhelming, the whole smart city concept. But you know, if I kind of break it down, I suppose, in terms of a, a couple of ideas, um, you know, I've mentioned Aptiv already, but clearly... Uh, electric vehicles, vehicles that are um, more autonomous. So self-driving vehicles will probably be a feature of smart, uh, a feature of smart cities. Again, Aptiv is exposed to that vehicle autonomy theme, electric vehicles. We own a business called Kone, which is Finnish listed. Kone is, is one of the leaders um, in, in elevators and escalators. But they're very strongly focused on energy efficiency, next generation technology in terms of elevators and how you move people around that, that city. So from that point of view, I think there's some kind of obvious areas um, w w within the, the smart, smart City initiative. And then if you kind of flip over um, to technology, for example, um, you know, some of the big technology players, Microsoft, Adobe, again, they you know, are key players in enabling um, you know, smart cities. City. And lastly, um, you know, if you think about kind of power generation, it, you know, where the, where those things are powered and how they are powered, whether it be um, the energy source being wind and solar, but also the grid. So if you think about um, grid technology, um, you know, things like smart grids. That's really important. So we own another business which is listed in in um, in the Netherlands called Alfen. 
that Alfin, if you, you know, the leaders in, in, in Holland in this um, around kind of battery storage for your grid, the leaders in, in rolling out electric vehicle charging points. So it's really once I, I guess you break down that concept into what it means for the investments, there's lots that you can get into. And we kind of, we, we, we put it in those buckets. Um, and again, an area that we think is really exciting. Yeah, I mean, like you said, you've obviously talked about fund is a lot more than just renewable energy and electric vehicles, which many people might think. And yeah. I can see you're obviously quite invested in the sort of technology and the technology supply chain. Um, it's actually a really big story at the moment. It's a sort of lack of semiconductors. Um, there's a global shortage at the moment, um, lots of production slowing down. Um, is that something you're playing in the fund or being able to take advantage of? No, I mean, we, we, we don't have um, really, yeah, it, it's not something directly. Um, we do have a name, um, ASML, the Dutch listed company, which makes the machines, which makes uh, semiconductors. And you know, recently, if you look at the, the the last set of numbers, they are still beneficiaries, no matter if it's kind of too much or, or too little in the system, because they supply, whether it be Sam, Samsung or any of the US makers, they're supplying all of them, and they've got ninety percent market share in that next generation technology. You know, I think this chip shortage um, reflects a couple of things. Firstly, I think it's you know, clearly what we went through last year. Many of the factories were closed down, and they're starting back up. You know, I think it's been well flagged as you know you've already you mentioned, Ryan. It's, it, 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 these these factories take a while to start up. So, you know, I've read it might be three or four months before we get back to you know the the market not being in deficit. So, I would say I think this chip shortage is not a multi year event. But also, it reflects really um, you know, some of the things we've spoken about. You know, an electric vehicle has probably three times the content in terms of chips versus additional vehicle. So we actually see um, for something like an ASML, the opportunities longer term for their machinery, particularly that next generation technology um, in terms of chip lithography is so exciting and no one else can really do it and do it well. So the chip shortage is something we're looking at um, and we, we've got at the back of our minds, but it has no direct impact on the fund. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'd add, I suppose, on, on technology and technology supply chain, we still see so many interesting opportunities. You know, it's linked in some things we've spoken about already, but you know, one, one of the things that we've really noticed is that how early we are on in this kind of digital shift. I think sometimes we think about how we consume um, every day. We're used to doing kind of tap and pay. We're not really using cash anymore. But if you look at the average industry, it might be agriculture, construction, digitization rates are well below 10%. So um, you know, there's a number of companies we own that are long-term beneficiaries of this. But also, the, I think the positive impact of technology um, is being recognized more and more. If you find that right business that, you know, like you say, it kind of plays into the supply chain that, you know, we think there's really high doable barriers around them as well. It's a really fascinating area. Well, David, I mean, what, what a fascinating note to finish on. Thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, Ryan. And if you'd like to find out more about the Rathbone Global Sustainability Fund, please visit our website, fundcaliber.com. And for more from our Investing on the Go podcast, please don't forget to subscribe. Please remember, we've been discussing individual stocks to bring investing to life for you. It is not a recommendation to buy or sell. The fund may or may not be holding these stocks at time of your listening. Mm-hmm.